much, I guess. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the Beacon Chain Explorer that we've been working on. And the talk uh, is called Deep Dive into the ETH 2.0 Beacon Chain Explorer. Um, I'm Stefan Stafflinger, and I work for Bitfly, as I mentioned before. Um, and I'm going to skip some because uh, I already introduced Bitfly. And uh, after that, uh, I'm going to just talk a bit about the architecture, how we implemented the um, Explorer, um, and how we might uh, reconsider once kind of phase one and the sharding uh, starts to kick in. Um, and then a bit about the contribution, because we're doing it all open source. So uh, we would be happy for anyone who uh, sees any issues, uh, creates them uh, on, create some issues on GitHub, creates pull requests. Uh, and we also have a Gitcoin grant uh, that you can support. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to conclude, uh, kind of recap and uh, the future outlook, what we're uh, currently uh, working on, what we're developing. Um, so to the introduction, um, uh, as stated, uh, a lot will change uh, when uh, Ethereum switches from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, and to keep things uh, concise and accurate, uh, as said, I will stick to the near future, uh, and put the near in parentheses because it's always uh, uh, not that, well, it's not that certain when uh, finally uh, um, we're gonna switch, when, this, when the switches actually happen, when exactly the phases are coming out. So um, my main focus is uh, on phase zero. Um, which introduces a coordination layer uh, called Beacon Chain. Um, and the Beacon Chain is kind of tasked with the administrative work that comes uh, along with uh, sharding and proof of stake, We're kind of with that design. Um, and the Beacon Chain holds uh, an ever-growing record of validators, um, which kind of hold the stake in the system, and it also records their votes. Um, it also distributes uh, the newly issued Ether, uh, which previously was done through mining, uh, which is now done through kind of a testing. Um, and uh, it also um, records kind of validators that uh, exit, validators that get slashed, uh, whose stake gets taken away. And uh, the beacon chain uh, achieves consensus through two can, uh, key mechanisms. Uh, the first is called uh, GHOST, which is short for greediest, uh, heaviest observed subtree. Um, and the second is called Casper, FFG, short for Casper's friendly finality gadget. Uh, GHOST is uh, a fork choice rule, uh, which in other words is the mechanism where validators attest uh, to blocks, um, which kind of is understood as voting. Um, and through their vote, uh, they signal support um, for the blocks, um, and this mechanism is used to choose the head of the chain, and it is asynchronous, allowing validators to attest in conditions of high network latency. It also is live, meaning that heads uh, can be constantly added, and even though Ghost is used uh, to choose the head, it does not finalize the choice, um, and it can always change it, its mind, kind of like the fork choice, the reorganization is kind of uh, where that uh, it's uh, where that places, um, and uh, the second step um, is where Casper comes in, um, and Casper FFG finalizes blocks in a two-step process. Uh, these two steps are termed justification and finalization, um, kind of like uh, when a block uh, gets enough um, um, how, how it's called again. Um, confirmations um, of the chain um, in proof of stake. It doesn't need uh, confirmations, but once it's finalized, you can kind of uh, see it as set in stone. Uh, and the mechanism um, reaches consensus uh, by, um, well, sorry, um, uh, the justification and finalization. Uh, it is a mechanism uh, by which consensus is reached uh, and safety is ensured. And for a block to be justified, uh, it must have two thirds of votes. And for a block to be finalized, it must be justified. Uh, and it must be a direct descendant of a finalized block. It's kind of the, the overview of what the beacon chain is so far. 
Um, and uh, the Beacon Chain Explorer, uh, if you want to follow along, you can go on uh, beaconchain uh, beaconchain.in um, and we kind of try and make it uh, more accessible for everyone that doesn't want to read code or anything. And if you go on the website, you kind of uh, get to the homepage and uh, here you can already see which testnet we're running um, and you can um, kind of see the current state of the network. You can kind of see the most recent epoch, uh, the most recent finalized epoch, um, the most recent slot, how many validators are, act validators are currently active, pending um, validators that are, want to join, uh, validators that want to exit. Um, and you can see also how much uh, Ethereum is staked at the moment and how much the average balance is um, for uh, the validators. And over here we have kind of a, a historical view of how it develops, how the beacon chain develops, how much ether is staked overall, which is the blue line, and uh, how many active validators there are. And you can see uh, kind of how that changes over time. And it's also important to see uh, these things because the more validators are in the system, the uh, less lucrative it is for someone to actually join. Um, and below, we just have kind of an overview of the most recent blocks. And you can see the different states here. Um, and here on an epoch can have many slots. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail now. So um, for the Beacon Chain Explorer, um, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, an easy way to see proposed blocks, follow attestation, and monitor your staking activity. Uh, in the current state of the Explorer, we can browse epochs, validators, blocks, statistics, and play around with a validator dashboard. Together, uh, we will have a look at these features individually, uh, and uh, yeah, feel free to follow follow along. Um, yeah, that's kind of the overview. And here we kind of have uh, a tweet that was posted out kind of a milestone when uh, 2,000, uh, 200k slots uh, were proposed and 35k active validators. And I think we're at 600k right now. Um, and so let's have a look at uh, epochs and blocks. So uh, an epoch is um, kind of uh, a checkpoint and the checkpoint uh, comes every uh, 6.4 min uh, minutes around that time. Uh, and it consists of 32 uh, slots, um, which is kind of like there's a possibility that uh, a slot contains a block, but it doesn't have to. Uh, so a validator, um, because it's uh, according to a time, so in, in a slot, if a validator misses to propose, uh, that slot uh, is kind of empty. It's an, uh, a block doesn't get proposed, but that slot still exists. And we can kind of see the most recent blocks here. And up here, we can see the epochs, um, and we can see uh, um, kind of the, the an overview. And right now uh, that I'm doing the presentation, the system kind of has uh, an issue with reaching finalization, uh, as a lot is not finalized for some reason. But we do have a lot of voter participation. So I'm not too sure why that's, why that's happening. Uh, um, if some discord might might have an idea uh, and you can see how many attestations there are we can have a, a bit of a closer look let's maybe see look at one that's finalized uh, and we can kind of uh, have an overview of exactly uh, what's happening in this epoch you can see how much uh, is staked and uh, from the possibility of how much can be staked um, and the current state, how many validators there are. And we can see an overview of all the slots that are in this time and epoch time inter interval in this kind of checkpoint. Uh, and those are 32 and some of them are proposed. Some of them are missed because the validator is offline and some of them are offered uh, because the block uh, choice rules or goes kind of went in a, in a different direction. Uh -huh. So yeah, let's look at the, the next bit. The more interesting uh, thing for probably most uh, are the, the validators. So uh, to become a validator, you have to pay 32 ETH into a deposit contract. 
Um, and on the right side, you can see kind of uh, the different states that a validator can be in. Um, and the first uh, is to be in a deposit contract, and then you have to wait uh, some time uh, to reach kind of the pending state. And in the pending state, uh, you're put into a queue to be activated. Uh, and once you're kind of in this circle here, uh, you can uh, start attesting, uh, start creating, uh, uh, proposing blocks um, as long as you're online. Uh, and the next two states that you can kind of uh, go over to are either exiting or slashing. And there's multiple reasons why you could uh, go to exiting or slashing. Slashing, for example, if you vote uh, for two different um, possible uh, chains, uh, at the same uh, at the same time, so in one epoch you have two votes, um, and someone discovers that you're voting twice, uh, you can be slashed, um, and then uh, you can voluntarily, for example, exit or your uh, balance falls too low because your validator is just offline all of the time, and then it can go over to uh, the exiting state, um, and then both of them uh, don't actually stop attesting and proposing blocks straight away. There is some delay to kind of ensure the stability of the system uh, before they actually exit the system. And then once your uh, your validator has exited the system, um, if it's under normal circumstances, then you can access your funds uh, after about one day. And if you've been slashed, it takes uh, maybe a uh, a month or a, a lot longer before you can actually access your funds again. Um, and that's kind of uh, to ensure this incentives. And then there's uh, another concept of the validator, which is the effective balance. If we maybe if I have a validator open here, maybe uh, we can here see kind of an overview of all the validators. And you can also filter here uh, all of them, the, the states. You can see if they're offline or, or online. Um, you can see uh, the active validators, the validators that are in the slashing, slashing, slashing state, exited state, and validators that have exited. And then you can see, look at their index. The validators kind of get an insert index as they get inserted to the chain. Um, and here we can kind of have uh, see an overview of this one individual individual validator. We can kind of see what blocks they propose and if they propose them or miss them. In this case, the validator manage to propose all the blocks. We can see the attestations that uh, the validator, kind of the votes that the validator made uh, um, for the uh, individual slots. Uh, um, and here we can kind of see the balance of the validator over time. So if he behaves correctly, the valid balance should be increasing. And the effective balance uh, kind of um, is the measure by which you actually earn more. So. Uh, the more balance uh, you have, the more stake you uh, have, and the more uh, kind of you you should get from the new ETH that gets issued. But it's uh, actually it goes in steps, um, and that's kind of um, fixed by the uh, effective balance. So even though the your actual balance uh, can rise, um, your effective uh, balance uh, is capped, but it cannot it can fall below. Um, and it goes in steps, so it doesn't go linearly, it goes in steps. So if the balance would fall below uh, 3.2, uh, the effective balance would uh, fall uh, a great step and your income would uh, be lower. So, for example, it would be important to, to make sure your balance stays, stays above that point. Maybe here we can see uh, a mist, for example, this uh, mist to propose the, uh, the, the slot. So this slot will be empty uh, as no without really a block because the um, the validator missed to propose it. Um, and next, kind of the slashing, um, we kind of have an event here. Um, voluntary. Oh no, I don't actually. I didn't add the slashing event, but uh, basically, uh, a slashing event occurred and. Um, the validator then uh, gets punished and the uh, the balance uh, gets reduced and then here i added some events that happened um here we uh, actually added uh, a nice tweet where we actually added uh, a leaderboard so people could kind of see um which validators were uh, more um 
kind of successful in the system uh, were online all of the time, didn't go offline, and which had the most uh, income. And here we can also sort it by uh, negative income. Um, and we can look at the, the validators here, why uh, maybe see why they're losing money, why they're, uh, and why it's, it's so bad. Uh, kind of uh, look into that. Uh -huh. And uh, another uh, thing that we had is here the first voluntary exit that happened. Um, and we can look at it by looking at block uh, 124, uh, 256. So if you want to, there uh, we looked at it. And then we can see here in the, in the, in the slot that got proposed, uh, we can see kind of the voluntary exit uh, that, have, that happened. And then we can see here one voluntary exit that happened. And another tab that we can see our validator zero did the um, exit uh, here, and then it's probably no longer a testing. And we can look at, so we can see the stat status uh, is that he exited. Uh, and the next one, uh, I already showed that, but here just in a bigger picture, so people can read it again, kind of the status update. So it's all still in the test phase. Uh, and the next thing that we have, next feature that we have is a validator dashboard. Um, so it's kind of if you have more than one validator or if you kind of want to monitor different validators, we created this dashboard where you can uh, kind of see different validators. You can add validators to the dashboard. So if I know the index of a validator, I can add it to the validator and then we can kind of see how many validators are pending, active, and exited. Um, and here we have the exited validator that we've just looked at before, and we have different colors for them. So gray is exited, red is, uh, what was that, uh, inactive uh, and, uh, or offline, and um, the green is that it's online. And then over here, we can see the balance. We can see kind of the effective balance of all of the validators, and we can see the effectiveness, so how effective is the balance being allocated um, from, from the validators. Uh, and then an overview, we also have all the validators kind of to see how many proposed, how many missed, how many are orphaned, um, kind of to see if there's any issue with the validators, kind of just to go down and uh, see what's what's going on, not only with the, with the beacon chain now that's in the test network, but later on, especially for people that are running validators so they can kind of understand what is going on. And at the bottom, we kind of have an overview. We have like the online uh, um, symbol here if the validator is online and we have the state that they're in. So they could still be proposing uh, if they were in a slashed state or um, if they were in an exiting state, but this one's not proposing anymore because it's, it's exited. Uh, and then uh, the next part is we also have some statistics. Uh, so we can see the proposed blocks, the active validator count. We can see the total stack ether of the network. So we kind of try to make a daily overview of uh, of the of the overall system to kind of see how it's progressing, see how it's working. Um, and for example, the overall proposed blocks. So we can see kind of at this day there was something because so many blocks were missed, and here not even like se only seven blocks were proposed. So this could be uh, maybe an architecture mistake where we don't get the right information or our node, our beacon node uh, might uh, be not working properly. Um, or it might be the beacon chain that, uh, that's something wrong or just if everything's working right, just the validators that are offline or not working properly. Um, and here you can kind of, kind of get an overview of that. And there are many, a uh, few different charts that we're still working to improve on that. Um, and then the next uh, part is I'm going to talk a bit about the architecture. Um, so we have uh, basically a beacon node running all in one virtual machine. Um, we have, which is shown up here, the ETH2 node. And then we have just a, a Go exporter program that runs and it just gets uh, the information, aggregates, uh, filters the information that we need um, and writes all of that into a Postgres database. Uh, and then our front end is just a Go server that uh, just has a few handlers for the pages that we are running. Uh, and it just queries the Postgres uh, database that gets continuously updated through the exporter. 
um, and then it's all uh, behind the Cloudflare. And uh, what we'll have to consider uh, maybe in the future um, is that uh, with the sharding with phase one, uh, maybe one Postgres database might be too small. So in the future, we might uh, consider kind of changing that up a bit, uh, maybe having a different uh, scalable solution to get quick real-time statistics um, as seen here uh, to kind of get a bit more insights kind of here you can see for example the validators that are currently in the network how that changes over day but to kind of have more complex statistics we might have to uh, consider especially with not just the beacon chain but uh, all of the individual um, shards that that are going to be created in the future and that's kind of our uh, architecture overview um, um, and then quickly going to go over the contribution that uh, so if you want to kind of participate contribute we have a Gitcoin grant that you can go to from our website so you can go click on the Gitcoin grant we have a nice description and we would uh, be happy if you would uh, support the development uh, um, we also have a GitHub repo where you can create issues. So the ETH2 Beacon Chain Explorer, uh, you can create pull requests um, and you have a nice description of how to get uh, started, uh, what features there are. Um, and then, um, yeah, just tweet uh, at etherchain.org um, and um, we will be happy about any, any feedback. Um, and now to the conclusion, we kind of looked at the uh, beacon chain, the phase zero, um, how it kind of makes choices, where in the Explorer you can find kind of find things about the beacon chain, kind of understand if you want to have a validator running, it's uh, quite good to kind of play around with it. Um, also, uh, we talked a bit about how the architecture looks like, how we might uh, have to adapt in, with, in the future phases. Um, and uh, for the outlook, uh, so we're uh, considering creating more advanced network metrics. Uh, we have some really cool uh, features that uh, a colleague is working on that's going to come. And we're also uh, going to consistently work on new uh, staking services kind of to assist validators um, in, the, in the process of uh, staking. Yeah. So. Um, Thank you for listening and if you have any questions that went uh, a lot quicker than I thought. Uh, anything to add? Do you feel like there's anything that you'd like to talk about? Um, how about um, how about the experience in, in, in building this? Why don't you come back to your uh, to your yeah. Up the yeah, we can go like uh, what I didn't show yet is a kind of a visualization which we also have. So here you can uh, also kind of see the proposed blocks, you can kind of see uh, blocks that are, are missed, how it kind of branches uh, uh, away um, and uh, have kind of a, a look at the state that gets updated, updated live, which is, uh, which is pretty cool to see kind of how, how it changes, how new, uh, new blocks slots get added uh, all the time, which is really fun. Um, and we also have a kind of a docs where you can kind of read about uh, some of the terms when you when you get confused up there. Yeah, but uh, I mean, it's all still a, a test network. We kind of have a search here where you can search uh, either the index, you can uh, search for different blocks that you're looking for epochs. Um, yeah, that's kind of kind of uh, it right now. And it was. Uh, it's really fun fun to build it's always changing um and um the network gets uh, kind of shut down up uh it gets uh turned on again because it's still a test network so soon there's going to come an update uh with the i mentioned it uh, with the multi client so the lighthouse uh client and the prism client they are going to implement the i think newest uh spec uh, and they're going to publish that soon and so we are gonna have the first multi-client uh, Beacon Chain Explorer, and I hope that it will all work uh, great. Uh, Buta asks, what makes Beacon Chain better than Etherscan's Explorer? Well, uh, it has a lot more functionality in the pipeline that's uh, gonna make it a lot better, even though it already is a lot better, of course. 
uh, and for one thing, uh, with the whole ecosystem kind of heavily leaning on open source, uh, we kind of embrace that uh, with our explorer as well. So I wouldn't necessarily call it better, but I think our explorer fits uh, into the ecosystem a lot better. That answers the question. <laughs> Let's talk about the experience of building this. Um, a bit more like what concrete? Do you want to know anything? Uh, Specific, so kind of the architecture. We we kind of get uh, the uh, information from the beacon node. So we're kind of heavily relying on on the development team there, building uh, on on kind of that node, making that better, um, improving on that, and then we get that information. We kind of write all of that into the Postgres database, um, and then we try and uh, kind of find good ways to display it. So one uh, issue we, we kind of uh, still have is that we're using an, uh, a graphing library that uh, is not necessarily completely open source. So if someone else wants to run this Explorer, um, it might be uh, uh, against the terms still. So we're still looking at maybe other uh, charting libraries. That's one of the difficulties that we have. Um, Kind of finding everything uh, good products that are all open source uh, because we're really happy with the charting library we're using right now, but uh, the licensing is a bit of an, an issue there still. Um, and uh, overall, it's it's quite uh, there's quite a few uh, issues uh, uh, or things that are hard to understand from the spec from the implementation. <clears throat> um, yeah. So one of the things that's really interesting to me, looking from it from the outside, or just or just using chain explorers for for years now, is what's is there a financial model in it for you? Uh, well, we have the the grant, uh, which is uh, great, um, and it might might be able to kind of right now pay for the for the uh, VM. Like it's a very lightweight architecture still. Um, as I mentioned later on with all the shards, it might be a bit more difficult and we might have to think a bit more about the business model and how we can actually uh, make some money off it. There's, uh, there's different uh, uh, ways that we can do it. Uh, we can think about uh, maybe doing some staking as a service. We can think about kind of having proprietary, uh, proprietary but it's, I'm just like saying hypothetically, uh, proprietary like uh, features uh, that make it maybe um, easier to stake um, stake the the funds. There are different staking pools. So with the with the knowledge that we get from from creating this explorer, there's actually a lot we can do. Um, so essentially, B two B services potentially with the with the expertise. Well, potentially. Um, but it's not nothing set in stone. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. No, I know. I mean, it's clear that it's clear that you're a builder. Um, yeah. yeah, and it okay, and and based on grant funding and whatever. But I'm just really curious about the the economics of the business space of of these things. How how do you see that developing? Not in the immediate or near future, but over you know over the next ten years. Where do you see the the specific potential only in consultancy services, or do you see any sort of fee model for for usage of of explorer data? Um, well, you know, for sure, you can offer APIs uh, as well, as, because just requesting information from uh, the nodes um, can be quite slow, especially if you want to get any aggregated data. Um, so we could offer API services uh, for other people building uh, on top of uh, Ethereum, um, building on top of ETH2, that would maybe be a possibility. Um, so 20 years from now, where is historical data from a bloating, a continually bloating chain going to be stored? Who's going to pay for that to be stored? Um, yeah. is... so especially when the sharding comes and it's it's a lot of data, <laughs> there we could uh, do a like, uh, some low latency API that uh, quickly gets uh, data from all of the shards because uh, the beacon chain is there to kind of synchronize the different 
So yeah, I'm, but I'm not I'm, talking about real-time data. I'm talking about historical yeah. data. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you can get the historical data in the time, kind of, instead of kind of trying to get that in some in in some magnetic tape somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm also really super curious about about your um, um, hosting and and that whole environment. What are you guys building on? How are you how are you dealing with all of this data? Uh, well, right now from uh, from the VM that can be, well, it's all mainly on uh, Google Cloud right now, or uh, we have some things on dedicated VMs. So it's just a normal PostgreSQL for that right now. Um, what's the most interesting part of uh, the work that you're doing for you personally? The most interesting part? Um, well, for me, it's it's kind of uh, we're creating things for for us more than for a, a government or any other entity. Uh, it's kind of like a, a true democracy in in a sense, more or less, um, that we kind of can choose oh, how to help oh, create. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially with code. Yeah. So a lot of people are complaining about the government. Uh, about corruption and maybe that's uh, a vector where we can kind of uh, have it better or worse. Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> so then let me ask you a, a two a two part question. Um, yeah. Obviously, being a technological leader in the space and on the front end, um, two things. Do you have any contact with uh, with government agencies that are looking to move into uh, hosting and distributing data uh, in this way, um, and it, regardless, yes or no, how do you feel about uh, state co-option or implementation of the tools that it is that we're building in our parallel economy and parallel society? Um, well, the first part, uh, we, we don't have too close uh, contact with any, any government. Yes, even though Vienna is actually quite on the forefront of kind of uh, developing um, digital city being and Walter yeah. Hofer and all those people. So uh, I think like uh, not just Vienna, but I think Austria is doing like a great job of kind of embracing the technology. Um, but uh, we're not directly involved in that. We're, we kind of try to just uh, stay low key and and kind of build what we what we're looking at. So. We're not too strong on the consultancy front. You're so um, lucky that I never heard of Bitfly until you applied for your it, until you applied for your talk, and I looked yeah. at it and I googled around and went, "Oh, okay, right." <laughs> and Stefan uh, Karpasek from from uh, Bitcoin Austria and and Etherisk also mentioned to me that uh, that you do really great work. So oh, thank you. It's um, really super impressive to see, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and what was the second part uh, of the of the question? Um, how do you uh, how do you feel about uh, governments and institutions, legacy governments and legacy institutions implementing the technology that we're building? Do you strive for that, or are you concerned about it? I think, especially now with with Corona, um, it just shows that there's uh, really some efficiency gains that can be can be won uh, if they do implement it. Uh, it just really depends uh, on the right way to implement it uh, and i guess that's really the hard part uh, and like the potential for abuse is pretty pretty big so that's kind of exciting to kind of see different states implementing it the same for ai so there's a lot of of like games that can be won but uh, using face re recognition is also very dangerous yeah yeah it's hard to be optimistic at this time yeah. but i think that efficiency wins um, let's talk about then the potential implementations of, of AI bots and machine learning bots in crawling and providing information. What do you see uh, as potential um, uh, benefits uh, in that area for, for blockchain data? Uh, what do you mean? Um, what I, I don't quite see the connection with with crawling like uh, Google. Uh, you mean like uh, exploring kind of the the data? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Okay. No. Uh, um, so 
I mean, there's there's so many blockchains out there right now, uh, and then there's going to be a lot more in the future. And million uh, chains. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there's a lot of like kind of unique data independent of the blockchain, uh, and um, that's an issue. Uh, kind of that you have so much unique data, it's pretty hard to kind of uh, optimize uh, to store uh, in a, in a good way. But then again, it's actually quite easy to find again. So you can just create like a huge hash table and just get any uh, uh, index, any private, well, not the key or address or whatever, and get that out of the database um, for just any any node. And there's going to be so huge amounts of data that need to be searched um, or that someone wants to search uh, for just different blockchains. And it's so easy to kind of switch uh, money from one blockchain to another so especially with explorers uh, it's going to be interesting to kind of see some some interoperability uh, in in them uh, to kind of display not just one blockchain but kind of have the possibility to display different blockchains and kind of the connections between them so that's that's a tough tough challenge with like huge graphs and uh, yeah that's what i'm saying so for with machine machine learning iterations and and yeah. ai algorithms potentially coming up with uh, very very streamlined ways of of quickly finding moving uh displaying etc data how do you see uh zk proof data uh in terms of of uh zk proofs um providing more anonymity and uh you know basically clouding what it is that you can do uh with the data because at some point people are going to be able to have their own data and there's going to be efficient uh you know low cost ck proof calculations that we can do and all you're doing is getting a set of proof uh that people have done something essentially yeah I, I think it's really great, uh, especially like in the stateless client uh, uh, view. So there's uh, other blockchains that are kind of uh, creating just this constant size uh, uh, blockchain uh, where you always just have a proof and you don't actually need to download anything. So it's going to be great for, for kind of the light, lightweight users that want to use it. Um, like client wonder gun. Yeah. That's, I think that's really, really uh, interesting area. And I'm excited to see how that develops. And many different uh, use cases maybe provide privacy on Ethereum as well, uh, a lot more, uh, even though everything is public. So that's the dream that's, public, yeah. public secrets. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah, cool. So Thank companies are working on that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you. Cool. Um,